Before the video starts, I just want to say that usually I like to find relevant footage for the ships I'm talking about, but there's just not a lot of relevant footage. These ships are kind of new. So, uh, yeah, that's all. Enjoy. Following a long and bloody war, humanity found itself in a strange place. Thanks to the splintering of the Covenant, they have the largest remaining navy and military, and the most territory of any faction. Thanks to their wide-ranging skill set, they've reverse-engineered Covenant and Forerunner technology to create ships greater than many fielded even by their now-defeated alien enemy. But they have next to no allies, and distrust is rampant within their own borders. To re-establish order, and ensure the enemies of humanity are held at bay, the UNSC needed new weapons to keep up with their alien assailants. These were those weapons. Hey people, Mark here, and welcome to another batch of ship breakdowns. This one was interesting. These post-war ships are very different for humanity. I know the 343 era of ships is divisive, but I think they did a good job differentiating them with the previous group. These frigates really do feel more advanced than the previous set. I love the Human Covenant War era ships, don't get me wrong, but just looking at the newer ships and all the details we know about them, you just get the impression they would absolutely body the old guard. As always, I hope you like it, and if you do, uh, hitting the button would be appreciated, and a sub would make you my favorite kind of person, the kind that subscribes to me. Sources are Halo 4, Halo 5, Halo Infinite, Halo Rubicon Protocol, Mythos, Warfleet, and the Encyclopedia. Here we go. To refrain from straying from our roots too soon, let's start with the newest ship to be unveiled. The only frigate to keep the classic design following the end of the Human Covenant War, the Mulsanne class light frigate might look familiar, but like all post-war frigates, is an entirely different beast. The Mulsanne superficially retains the older design philosophy, but on closer inspection, you'll find the engines are not affixed to the wings. An improvement on what I said in part one is, I believe, a massive design flaw in the older frigates. Instead of working as wings, these plates now simply take the role of spaced armor. Now this is my own hypothesis of what these are, the encyclopedia sheds no light on it. Spaced armor was an innovation of the mid-19th century. The idea being that thin, supplementary armor pieces with space in between could achieve satisfactory results rather than having to forge or machine entire new armor plates. The hope was that projectiles, once they impact or penetrate the spaced armor, would deform, tumble, deflect, or disintegrate. Spaced armor has been used on warships, tactical machinery, and mostly tanks, but it has actually appeared in real life on spacecraft in the form of a Whipple shield. Whipple shields are armor pieces made of layers of fabric to protect occupants and systems from micrometeors moving at high speeds. It's not meant to totally stop an object, but to at least break it or slow it down. Sort of like a gambeson for spaceships. Getting back on track, that is what I assume these armor plates are for, aside from keeping with the old style. As we'll see later in the video, the UNSC is not sentimental when it comes to looks. I'm not sure the value of spaced armor when it comes to plasma. I don't have enough physics knowledge to understand or begin to research the effects of superheated liquid splashing in space. But if these shots from the fall of Reach are any indication, plasma torpedoes themselves quite easily punch through the comparatively flimsy armor of a Paris-class frigate. So I could see any extra armor being a plus, as did the UNSC with the Autumn and Marathon-class cruisers, which also incorporate armor around the engines. These big plates are also notably only protecting the engines and the habitable areas around those, almost as if a certain ship type was vulnerable to engine damage in the past. Further, the externally attached and exposed engines leave the ship vulnerable to partial neutralization. The construction of these flanking engines is such that if one engine is disabled, the ship can only direct rear force out of one side, which would send the ship spinning in space and render its mech, its primary weapon, effectively useless. The engines themselves extrude directly from the rear, with two large primary engines. Two smaller secondary engines are affixed below them, with a third pair of tertiary engines next to them. The Mulsanne is noticeably more compact than any of the previous frigates with its bridge much less protruding and lacking any of the keel hangers of the stalwart Charn and Paris classes. No numbers have been given on the crew and complement, but a lack of any deployment bays or hangar leads me to believe it has no infantry or ground armor on board, and its size would very much make it a surprise if it carried strike craft or pelicans. If the Hiragak liberated from the Covenant during the war have been consulted, I wouldn't be surprised if the typical 250 sailors required to operate warships has been trimmed down significantly. In fact, for a ship of this size, I estimate that at most a couple dozen hands are required to operate it. Even from a tonnage perspective, the Mulsanne appears to come up short. 
Measuring in at 456 meters and weighing a measly 0.9 million tons, the Mulsan is shorter and lighter than any of the wartime frigates, but employs some of the most novel weapon systems of the post-war Navy. The Mulsan class has effectively taken the Paris class heavy frigate's role in the fleet, which might be jarring at first glance at the ship's size, and even more so its armament, as opposed to the Paris class's magnetic accelerator cannon, three Shiva nuclear missile silos, 12 harpoon nuclear missile silos, 12 point defense guns, and 26 archer missile pods, the Mulsanne employs only 20 M58 Archer missile pods and 12 M870 Rampart Point defense guns. What's going on here? Well, the key game changer here is the Mulsanne's massive Bright Lance compound reflex laser. Why is this such a big deal? Well, to explain that, I'll have to get into the details behind why Max and lasers are different. I have a much longer video on the topic of energy weapons plan, so I'll be as brief as I can. Do keep in mind, I am not a physicist, nor am I an autodidact. Magnetic accelerator cannons are massive coil guns or Gauss rifles. How it works is, a ferromagnetic projectile, in the UNSC's case either ferric tungsten or depleted uranium, is pulled by multiple electromagnets in sequence, deactivating as the next activates, pulling the slug down the barrel and accelerating it as it goes. They exist in real life, but are either unfortunately, or fortunately depending on how you want to look at it, much less potent than the ones we see in Halo, at least for now. This system allows for extremely high velocity projectiles to be hurled across vast distances. The numbers vary by the Mach, but the Supermax orbiting reach according to the Fall of Reach novel could fire 3,000 ton projectiles at 0.04% the speed of light. Now that is very fast, and very powerful. Contrasting this with lasers, the immediate difference is obvious. The velocity of a laser, if you could call it that, is as close to instant as you can get. You probably already know this, but laser beams move at the speed of light, which is as fast as a something can go. This immediately gives them greater operational range, and depending on how you utilize laser systems, you can get a variety of results. The one that probably comes to mind immediately is the CW or Continuous Wave Laser. These are lasers that emit a constant, uninterrupted beam with a stable output power. When contact with a target is maintained, heat damage does the work rather than the brute force of a kinetic weapon like a Mac. These are seen all over sci-fi, Covenant energy projectors, any classic sci-fi laser. Here you can see a United States Navy vessel shooting down an unmanned craft with a laser, I think this laser is continuous wave, but uh, a side note, this weapon was developed by the Office of Naval Research. I don't know if it was intentional when they named Oni, but that is, that is startlingly similar. Pulsed lasers are my personal favorite, and they work a little differently. Basically, a pulsed laser is only on in pulses. That is to say, it's only firing the laser in intervals. This results in mechanical shock due to repeated short bursts of extremely hot conditions, like a speed of light jackhammer made of photons while also keeping heat generation and power consumption minimal. There are differences in effect based on how long your pulses are. Shorter pulses and longer off periods allow for both the weapon and the target to cool, resulting in a more precise drilling effect. Longer pulses cause a heating effect more akin to continuous wave lasers with the power saving benefit of being off half the time, but still applying that drilling effect. I assume, based on how the Bright Lance fires, it is either one huge pulse laser or a huge array of small pulse lasers because it behaves most similarly to real-life pulse lasers that only fire for a fraction of a second, like this 13 kilojoule laser made by the brilliant Styro Pyro. If you haven't seen his channel, check it out. He is an absolute psychopath. It's in the description. What the fuck is he doing now? As I said, all the real-life examples of extremely high-energy pulsed lasers I can find only fire for a fraction of a second because of the ludicrous amount of energy they take. But using my ever-so-fallible human eyes and some video editing software, I deduced that the Bright Lance fires for about 1.14 seconds a pulse. So smarter people than me can work out what that would do to something. While I will simply state that a laser the size of the Bright Lance with the power generation and storage technology of the UNSC that would definitely do some damage. More than a Mac? Uh, hard to say. We can't know how well these work in-universe until we see a Bright Lance hit a target that's more than a skybox decoration, but I will say I have my doubts. There is definitely the benefit of range. Between a Super Mac and a Bright Lance, the Bright Lance is going to hit its target 287,800,759.7 meters per second faster than the Mac. And Macs are generally listed to have a range of 10,000 miles, or about 16,000 kilometers. That's not to say the projectile slows in a vacuum, just that at distances beyond 
that, it's pointless to try and hit a target that can effectively dodge. Future editing mark here adding in that this is also probably why it only shoots one pulse instead of a continuous wave or many pulses, because at long distances it's really hard to keep a laser steady, not to mention that jitter is a thing that exists in the universe, like everything that is moving is not moving in a straight line. There's nothing in the universe that moves in a perfectly linear uh, direction. Even light bends through space. It's called diffraction. Light does not move in a perfectly straight line. But at 10,000 miles, you can definitely move out of the way of a laser beam once you deduce what trajectory it's coming from. And in combat, when things are moving really fast, there's obviously not a lot of time to keep burning away at one precise location for a pulsed laser that's firing many pulses or a continuous wave laser to be doing that. It's just, it's just not feasible. Again, it could be worth the change, hard to say. I will say it takes considerably more energy to make a laser that can pierce armor than a kinetic weapon that flings a piece of metal, but we'll get into it when we talk more in depth about laser weapons at a later date. Back on topic, most notable ships of the Mulsanne class. There's the UNSC Mulsanne, of course, the lead ship of the class. The UNSC Panama was a Mulsanne active sometime after 2553. We know of two engagements that the Panama took part in. On an unknown planet, an unidentified class of Covenant assault carrier named Purveyor of Virtue, affiliated with an unidentified faction, targeted a UNSC fuel and power processing station. The Panama alone is obviously no match for a Covenant assault carrier, but being so close to the apparent capture target, the carrier refused to fire back for fear of damaging the base. Last we've seen of these two ships, they were locked in a stalemate. The Panama, at an earlier or later date, took part in an offensive action against the Banished, deploying Spartan teams to the surface of an unknown world to disable a Banished Gore Spike cannon. At least six Mulsanne-class frigates were present during the Battle of Zeta Halo between the UNSC and the Banished. The most notable, both of this battle group and of this class, is easily the UNSC Mortal Reverie. After the fall of the Infinity, her escorts didn't last long in the fight. The Mortal Reverie was shot down and crashed on the ring, damaging it beyond reasonable repair. Three days later, the Reverie's wreckage was converted into a UNSC base of operations. What am I looking at? Frigate, Mulsanne class. Hull identification reads, Mortal Reverie. If we're gonna make any noise on this ring, we need a base of operations. It's beat to hell, but it's shelter. Defensible location, no sign of banished activity. Yeah, this could work. Any Spartans in comms range? Spartan Griffin is in range, but his signal is diminishing rapidly. I'll keep it brief. Open up a channel. I think we found our rendezvous point. In their new home away from home, the humans that regrouped at the Reverie, including Spartan Horvath, Kavan, Griffin, Stone, and hundreds of Marines, ODSTs, and civilians, started doing recon and forming a plan for their retaliation against the Banished. So, is it true? The report? Yes. The Banished are deploying resource harvesters, and... Never mind that. Did you pull an entire lifeboat out of one of the breaches in the ring? I ordered the squad inside to take shelter from the explosion. I wasn't going to let them die in it. <laughs> Fine work, Stone. Day one was dicey for all of us. We're still trying to figure out what happened. I'm glad you kept a cool head. I lent a hand this time. I'm sure they'll have my back next. If their reports are any indication, those Marines will follow you anywhere. And if we're going to take this ring back, we need everyone working together. What did you see on your recon sweep, Spartan? What's going on with the ring? No mistaking it. The ring is actively repairing itself. All those sentinels we saw buzzing around the spine are assessing damage, initiating repairs. Whatever the target did to the ring, it's being reversed, and quickly. This ring will be operational again. I'll make a note in our report. What now? We know what the Banished are after. It's our job to slow them down. Safe bet that the rest of the UNSC is operating under the same protocol. Get some rest, Marines. We've got a lot of chaos to engineer tomorrow. Eventually, Spartan Kavan discovered what she believed to be a weakness of the Banished defenses and the Spartan forces at the UNSC Reverie began to formulate a plan to assassinate Esherim, the acting war chief of the Banished. During the operation, Esherim authorized an attack on the mortal Reverie led by Tremonius. 
Griffin, this is Kavan. Report. Recon sweep of the red zone is complete. As we thought, the banished forces are highly stratified and fragmented. Competition and infighting is encouraged to elevate new leaders. Their unity hinges entirely on the war chief. If Isharam were removed. Assassination could sow a lot of chaos among the banished. It's risky, but it might be our best option. Good work, Kovan. Get back here. We've got some planning to do. Killing Eshram is the only viable option we have. A power vacuum like that would destabilize the banished and win us the footing we need to hold out until help arrives. I need volunteers, and I know I'll have no shortage of them. We all want a part of this. But we can't all go and leave Reverie undefended. So we're doing this the old-fashioned way. John Strauss. Are you kidding, Griffin? No, I'm not. This is the plan. A single strike team, deep in banished territory. Agile, quiet, on foot. It's the only way it's gonna work. This might be a one-way trip. So we need people to stay. Or well, there won't be anything left to protect. It's not up for debate. Panago, Malik, Sarkar, and me. That's the roster. For an assassination op? Decided by drawing straws. No, Griffin. We need you here at the Reverie. The Marines need a leader. We all do. The decision's made. We're gonna get this done now. Take out Eshram and take control of this ring. And you're right, the Marines need a leader. That's why you're staying here, to lead in my absence. I can't do You can and you will. I know you will, no matter what happens. Spartans, if anybody can hear me, I'm proceeding. We've come too far to turn back. Based on how hard the fight was between Master Chief and Esherim, you can imagine how well this went for the Spartan. He managed to escape with grievous injuries and was able to get a warning out to the forces at the Reverie. They decided to fight for their new home, a decision that would cost them dearly. This is Griffin, to the FFG 525. Reverie, do you read me? Griffin, you are badly injured. And your armor's medical systems are offline. Seek medical attention immediately. Open up a one-way encryption channel to Reverie's upspin transmitter. Encrypted one-way transmission confirmed. Record when ready. The mission was a failure. Eshram was waiting for us the whole time. Malik, Panago, Sarkar. All gone. Listen to me, Reverie. Eshram has dispatched almost every soldier and asset they have available. Their goal is... We have only one objective now. It is not victory. It is not extraction. It is not even survival. 
We must deny the banished this ring, no matter what it costs us. The mission was a failure. Eshram was... Malik, Panago, Sarkar. All gone. Listen to me, Reverie. Eshram has dispatched the most easy soldier in our... Vero, what is this? A transmission from Griffin. Fragmented from interference, but it's definitely him. This much is clear. The mission failed. Do you think he... do you think anyone survived? If what Spartan Griffin said is true, his loss is the least of our worries. They're coming. We must prepare. I've been running ops with Windfall for years. Broadsword sorties on Requiem, Prowler Corps maneuvers on a Kikyar Purse Moon, allied SOS strikes on brute raiding parties. Never once did I imagine I'd lose a squad mate to a straw draw assassination gone south. What a mess. Malik knew what he was volunteering for. They all did. It was worth the shot, Mako. Was it? We kicked the hell out of the proverbial hornet's nest and the hornets are mobilizing for some payback. Now, if we lose our foothold at the reverie, we lose the ring. There's a lot of lives at stake here. Some are suggesting we pull out and wait till the storm passes. And go where? Back to hiding in caves, skulking around at night? No. No, we hold. We make the banished bleed so that our sacrifices still mean something. <laughs> Eshram can keep his head. We'll take his pride. This is Spartan Stone to FFG 525. Do you copy? Repeat, do you copy? We copy, Spartan Stone. What's your position? I've got Boulder Squad at Sector 63 overlooking the gate. 525, I'm looking at the largest gathered force I've ever seen. The Banished are moving on the Reverie. They'll be there by nightfall. We can't hold them back much longer, sir! There's too many! We don't have a choice. If we lose Reverie, we lose everything. Hold the line, Marines! The Marine is correct, Vettel. Infantry and armor are pouring into valley by the hundreds. The reverie is already lost. So what? We just abandon it? Griffin warned us of this possibility. It is why we stayed behind. We must save who we can. She's right. We either leap now or reverie becomes a graveyard. Makovich, get the order out. Everyone falls back. Everyone. The Spartans tried their best and fought valiantly as Spartans do. But ultimately... The reverie and the lump sum of its inhabitants were lost, scattered, broken, defeated. Stone's completed her recon sweep. She located two squads taking shelter up north. That's an additional 12 to our confirmed survivor count. Any sign of the others? Griffin, Kovan, Orvath? No, not even at the prisoner camps. They're told it's been over a month since the reverie. Don't say it. I will not abandon them. We had to acknowledge reality. We lost the reverie. Our last forward operating base is now offline. We're scattered, and control of the ring is in Eshram's reach. We don't have many options left, but we do have orders. <sighs> Rubicon protocol. Stop or slow the banished by any means necessary. And keep Zeta Halo out of their control. Buy Earth as much time as we can. That's our mission now. After Spartan Stone returned to the Reverie, now a graveyard dubbed Outpost Tremonius, she followed the Banished back to an excavation site of obvious import to them. Open a one-way transmission. Initial sweep of the Reverie site is complete. The Banished Outpost here is more than a barracks. There are nothing forerunner tech from within the ring, including artifacts I've never seen before. But there's more. 
Over half of the banished detachment manning this post are peeling off to another excavation site. South of here. Orders from the war chief himself. A forerunner facility called the conservatory. Whatever it is, it's important enough to divert Eshram's sole focus. We need eyes on the conservatory as soon as possible. I go myself, but I need a closer look at the artifacts here. All this time we've assumed that Zeta Halo was like the others. What if it's something more? The rest of the survivors' escapades do not pertain to the Reverie, but I would be remiss not to acknowledge the fact that due to the actions of Spartan, Griffin, Stone, Kavan, Horvath, and the hundreds of Marines and ODSTs that died fighting for the Reverie in the Ring, the Banished were denied control of the superweapon. Despite the deaths of most of the super soldiers at the hands of the Spartan killers, a message in the bottle was left for someone special. Someone who, at humanity's darkest hour, still shined as a glimmer of hope in the black. Any UNSC personnel in range. This is Spartan Tomas Horvath, fire team intrepid, and I appear to be alone. I am heading up spin beyond the reach of the banished to search for survivors for my fire team. I don't know what else to do. The silence on UNSC channels is not encouraging, but I will be listening, watching, surviving. Chief. If you can hear this, we need you, now more than ever. In stark contrast with the Mulsanne, the Anlace class light frigate is a complete departure not just from UNSC frigate design, but from the entire UNSC ship design philosophy. It looks, operates, and fights in a totally unique manner among human ships. As a part of Aerofabrique's return to manufacturing spacecraft for the UEG, this strange little ship is the smallest frigate ever fielded by humanity. The Anlace measures in at a meager 372 meters and weighs 0.9 million tons. That is quite small, only 31 meters or about 100 feet longer than the longest UNSC Corvette. It's even more jarring when you compare it to the smallest Covenant Corvette, the Makar pattern, which measures in at 485 meters, 113 meters longer than the Anlace class frigate. Alongside the Strident class, hundreds of these were manufactured in shipyards orbiting Mars in tribute to compensate for the heavy losses accrued toward the end of the war. The ship is by far the smallest frigate, but does have its specializations focusing on fleet support, as such is probably rare for the ship to have to engage in direct ship-to-ship -ship combat. Still utilizing Titanium A armor plate, the Anlace is highly modular and allows for the optional addition of an electronic warfare suite, a nuisance for enemy communications and radar. I imagine this was only possible after making use of hard-won knowledge of Covenant computer systems gained during the war. These suites can also be used as effective cloaking devices, able to mask the presence of friendly ships or inhibit or intercept comms between enemies. Most impressively, two Anlaces equipped with an electronic warfare suite working in tandem are able to project a jamming blanket over an entire planet, effectively shutting down an entire system. The most powerful aspect of the Anlace class, in my opinion, is its high-definition sensors. These powerful little ships are able to accurately detect any object larger than a warthog up to 10 light minutes away. That's 111,800,000 miles. To try and help comprehend this, here's a picture of Earth from 40 million miles away. And Earth is about 46,372,727,000,000 times larger than a warthog. So yeah, that's pretty impressive. You would be hard pressed to sneak up on a fleet with these ships included, unless you were to be in slip space while doing it, in which case you would also not be able to accurately detect a fleet you're jumping into. The Anlace is the only UNSC frigate to have an internal bridge, I think. There's a bridge on this concept image, but the official art placed this here instead, which we will get into in a moment. This internal bridge fixes what is possibly the greatest design flaw of the entire UNSC Navy, a reliance on seeing outside. There are no windows to expose the captain and the entire bridge crew, meaning the ship is significantly better armored, even if the armor per square foot isn't that much greater. If this frigate's differences weren't stark enough, the armament of the Anlace class is the most unique the UNSC has ever deployed. Unlike any other UNSC ship, the Anlace class is completely devoid of kinetic weapons, and unlike any other energy-based ships in Halo, it has no plasma-based weaponry either. 
The entire armament of this class consists of lasers of differing types. The main gun of the Anlace is a Helios Capital Scale High Energy Laser. Unlike a Mac or the Bright Lance, the laser is turreted and can pivot independent of the ship's orientation. This is a huge advantage, as other frigates, including the Mulsan and Strident class, would have to turn and face their main gun away from the enemy if they wanted to retreat. The Anlace can fire most of its armament and its main gun while changing position. Four Magna 320 Capital Scale Pulse Lasers also adorn the ship, as well as eight ANSEC 11 point defense laser arrays. The pulse lasers also being categorized as capital scale implies that the size or power of the laser is at least comparable to the Helios. The Anlace's laser-based armament works especially well thanks to its highly accurate long-range sensors. This would allow the ship to utilize the effective range of what I can only assume are extremely powerful long-range weapons to weaken enemy shields long before they're within striking distance to the rest of the battle group. Since the Anlace is not necessarily meant to engage as a frontline combatant, I wouldn't be surprised if it was being used as a test bed for these energy-based weapon setups. And due to its unprecedented role in the fleet, having an unconventional arsenal isn't so strange, I suppose. The only known named ship of this class is the UNSC Anlace, the lead ship, of which we know nothing about. We do know, however, that Anlace-class frigates are deployable from the UNSC Infinity's Cat-8 sub-vessel deployment bays. We never see one deploy, but we do see two Anlaces escorting the UNSC Infinity in the Halo 5 loading screen, or main menu. These could be some Anlace-class Infinity sub-vessels, but they could also be normal escorts. Aside from the Infinity, one other ship has taken the spotlight of the post-war UNSC fleet. The Strident-class heavy frigate is one of the most powerful ships the UNSC has ever manufactured. It, alongside the Infinity, Autumn, Poseidon, and Vindication-class warships, are evidence that the UNSC is approaching a level of technology that humanity hasn't seen in over a hundred thousand years. Also manufactured by Aerofabrique, production began just before the end of the war in 2549. This ship represents some of the greatest innovation in the human naval industry. Measuring in at 575 meters and weighing in at 1.1 million metric tons, the Strident is easily the largest UNSC frigate, and represents the new apex of frigate design. Despite its size, the attack escort role of the Strident class is more akin to the light frigates of the past, being more versatile and able to support ground assaults more effectively than the Anlace or Mulsan class frigates. Also betraying its size, the required crew of the Strident class is significantly lower than previous heavy frigates. Requiring only 190 sailors, the ship incorporated quality of life and ease of use improvements acquired through reverse engineering by human scientists and likely suggestions from Oni acquired Hiragox. During the Human Covenant War, humanity's dominance in the ground arena is most likely what led to the role that frigates now occupy as the focus of the UNSC Navy. With ships like the Stalwart and Sharon classes in multiple instances rising to the occasion and culminating in a human victory. However, despite those ships' heavy ground support utility, the Strident incorporates only one Pelican dropship bay, with external hull clamps that can facilitate up to three more Pelicans. Furthermore, the Strident is not usually known to carry expeditionary troops in the form of Marines, with the exception of orbital dropshot troopers and the SOEV drop pod deployment bays needed to insert them properly. I'm looking at you, Marines on a Pelican in the Ark cutscene. Get off your ass and jump out. Interestingly, deployment bays for OF-92 booster frames are also included on the Strident class, a heavily armed single pilot space fighter usually reserved for deployment on board prowlers by Spartans. This was an addition I could see being made after witnessing time and time again the effectiveness of Spartan boarding parties, from the very beginning to the very end of the war. The engines of the Strident class also directly protrude from the rear of the ship also utilizing spaced armor plates to protect them from plasma fire. The Strident is still armored with the UNSC signature titanium armor plating, but for the first time among any human ship is able to be outfitted with energy shielding. While delays in the mass production of the ships in the aftermath of the war have prevented the majority of Stridents from utilizing this function, small generators are standard issue for sealing airlocks and hangars. Channels for waveguides and bay sockets for emitters are installed, making final integration of the main shield generators a straightforward process once they're made available. The bridge of the Strident includes a state-of-the-art combat management system and a data core able to store smart AI. The AI and automated systems handle target detection, threat evaluation, tracking, and calculation of firing solutions, but target priority and weapon release authorization is still in the hands of the crew, most likely unless direct orders are given to an AI to fire at will. You have the mech gun, Cortana. As soon as they come in range, open up. Gladly. Which brings me seamlessly to the greatest strength of the Strident-class frigate. 
As a bit of a return to form, the Strident has no energy weapons. The ship stays to the tried and true methods of ship combat, supplemented by new technology that only improved the effective strategies that the UNSC had grown used to. The Strident class is the only post-war frigate to have a magnetic accelerator cannon, bringing back the bifurcated frame of old. The ship's Mark IV heavy coil 94B1E6 Mac is a cut above the Paris class's 65P8V1 light Mac, which we know can, in two shots, break the shields of Covenant light cruisers and punch straight through the hull. This gun brings the Strident dangerously close in my opinion to the designation of Destroyer, as it rivals them and the light cruisers in firepower. And when coupled with the frigate's optional Hyperion warhead missile silo, it can quote, easily down a variety of Covenant capital ships, end quote. Aside from the six MH-70 Rampart Point defense guns and two M42 Archer missile pods, the entire remaining armament of the Strident class is new. Like the Mark 57 Arena Point defense gun, with six of them mounted in quickfire configuration with the Mark 55 Caster Naval Coil Guns, of which there are five. The Mark 55 Caster is a new iteration of the Mark 40 Caster Naval Coil Gun, which had previously only ever been used on the Mako class Corvette, a ship type that fell out of wide use during the Human Covenant War. With the help of the new combat management system and target scanner, incoming threats are evaluated, and ammunition types are switched to either sub-caliber armor-piercing sabots or proximity detonation fragmentation shells on a target-by-target -target basis. The first of the new era of frigates, the Strident class was actually the first deployed in 2549, two years before the end of the war, the lead ship being named, predictably, Strident. I want to retroactively correct a statement I made in part one of Frigates of the UNSC, FFG-427 and FFG-502 were not in fact Stalwart, Sharon, or Paris-class frigates, but early Strident-class frigates, likely a part of the first batch to be manufactured. They participated in the defense of Concorde in 2551, and it's likely that with all their technological innovations, their presence was integral to achieving a rare UNSC naval victory, forcing the Covenant to retreat. An unknown Strident-class frigate deployed ODSTs to an unknown world in 2552, of these ODSTs included then Lance Corporal Sarah E. Palmer. The UNSC Infinity is widely known to carry up to 10 frigates, either Anlace or Strident class. Of these ships, only one designation is known, Infinity Subvessel 3, a Strident class, which implies the existence of Infinity Subvessels 1, 2, and perhaps 4 to 10 if all the Infinity's Cat 8 subvessel deployment bays are utilized. But any number of these could also be Anlace class light frigates, we just don't know. As a part of Expeditionary Strike Group 1, Subvessel 3 and at least three other Stridents, it's hard to tell in this cutscene, were deployed from the Infinity to engage the Storm Covenant fleet orbiting Requiem in February 2558. Subvessel 3 is also known to have destroyed a Xanar pattern light cruiser, which had been deploying troops to engage Fireteam Crimson. At least three Strident class frigates escorted the Infinity as a part of Battlegroup Dakota, engaging the Mantle's approach during the New Phoenix incident, but were unsuccessful in stopping the ship and were likely unable to cause any meaningful damage. Multiple Stridents were forcefully powered down in the wake of Cortana's reclamation, but later, during the created conflict, at least five were deployed by the Infinity during Operation Wolf, an effort to retrieve cryogenically frozen cloned brains of Catherine Halsey, which would go on to create a certain potent weapon. It's been six months, where have you been? So, the new frigates of the UNSC, where to begin? I really like these, and I have to say the creation process of this video made me sad that 343 has never really focused on the naval combat side of things. I mean, they've got their hands full right now, but once things return to a stable point for Halo, which, for reasons I'll explain in a later video, I am convinced they will, I hope we get to see more of this stuff, especially weird things like the Anlace or the Mulsanne's Bright Lance. I want to see a Strident get the spotlight, I want to see its shields flare. Anlace class frigates in particular catch my eye because they only ever appear in the background of Halo 5, but like, you introduce a new frigate that unique and you never show it do anything? Come on. The Energy Weapon Incorporation is just so intriguing to me. Now that the Infinity is out of the way, <laughs> I want to see a battle group of Stridents, Mulsans, and Anlaces led by an Autumn class. That would be sick. But it's not entirely implausible that we'll get to see that. Right now, it's all hands on deck for Halo Infinite, as it should be, but in the future, a Halo Wars 3 is not entirely imperceivable. 
It's been pitched before at 343, and uh, in 2017 they revealed that a rejected concept for the game was placed on the shelf. Several concept artworks are public, and the pitch was primarily concerned with how they could do space combat. This was news to me as of writing this, and if this art is any indication, I am waiting with bated breath for anything to come of this. In conclusion, the new frigates of the UNSC are different, very different. We have yet to see them really shine, but they represent the colossal change the UNSC has gone through over the course of the war. That's all for this video. Let me know in the comments which, if any, of these were your favorites, but if you just hate all of these and everything 343 makes, I, uh, I, I guess that is an opinion you may hold. <laughs> if you liked it, please like, it helps out immensely. Let me know if there are any ships or Halo topics in general you'd want to see me cover, but for now, hasta luego. Arrivederci. Bye-bye.